Hello creators. Starting soon, I'm going to include guest speakers on the show. So if you're someone who works in the performing arts or the creative industry and you want to collaborate with me, then please send an email to sleeplesscreativespod at gmail.com. Introduce yourself and tell me a little bit about what it is that you do, and I'll get back to you with more information. Hello creators and welcome back. Some of you may have noticed that Spotify have given us the ability to leave a star review of our favourite shows. At the moment, we only have one, so it would mean a lot to me if as many of you as possible could leave a review for the show. It takes about five seconds to do. Just go onto the show page on your phone app and tap the star at the top of the page. And now on to today's very special text. It will make you laugh, it will make you cry. Today I'm reading Don Quixote, a very well-loved story written about 400 years ago by its author Miguel de Cervantes. The book has been adapted into plays, musicals and films throughout the years, one of which I was lucky enough to go and see on stage in London a few years ago and it was wonderful. The Cervantes Theatre in London was also named after the author, and it's a venue that is very well worth checking out. Here's a few words that I pulled from their website. The Cervantes Theatre is London's first venue dedicated to showcasing Spanish and Latin American plays, performed both in Spanish and in English. It opened its doors in 2016, and it is the proud creation of the Spanish theatre company, STC a charity which aims to bring the best Spanish and Latin American culture to London and to British audiences. I'll leave a link to their website in the episode description. So, take a moment to get cosy and comfortable and drift off. In a village of La Mancha, the name of which I have no desire to call to mind, there lived not long since one of those gentlemen that keep a lance in the lance rack, an old buckler, a lean hack, and a greyhound for coursing. An olla of rather more beef than mutton, a salad on most nights, scraps on Saturdays, lentils on Fridays, and a pigeon or so extra on Sundays, made away with three quarters of his income. The rest of it went in a doublet of fine cloth and velvet breeches and shoes to match for holidays, while on weekdays he made a brave figure in his best homespun. He had in his house a housekeeper past forty, a niece under twenty, and a lad for the field and marketplace who used to saddle the hack as well as handle the billhook. The age of this gentleman of ours was bordering on fifty, He was hardy of habit, spare, gaunt-featured, a very early riser, and a great sportsman. They will have it his surname was Quesada, or Quesada, for here there is some difference in opinion among the authors who write on the subject. Although, from reasonable conjectures, it seems plain that he was called Quejana. This, however, is of little importance to our tale. It will be enough not to stray a hair's breadth from the truth of the telling of it. You must know, then, that the above-named gentleman, whenever he was at leisure, which was mostly all the year round, gave himself up to reading books of chivalry with such ardour and avidity that he almost entirely neglected the pursuit of his field sports, and even the management of his property. And to such a pitch did his eagerness and infatuation go, that he sold many an acre of tillage land, to buy books of chivalry to read, and brought home as many of them as he could get. But of all, there were none he liked so well 
as those of the famous Feliciano da Silva's composition, for their lucidity of style and complicated conceits were as pearls in his sight, particularly when in his reading he came upon courtship and cartels, where he often found passages like, The reason of the unreason with which my reason is afflicted so weakens my reason that with reason I murmur at your beauty. Or again, the high heavens that of your divinity divinely fortify you with the stars, render you deserving of the desert your greatness deserves. Over conceits of this sort, the poor gentleman lost his wits, and used to lie awake striving to understand them and worm the meaning out of them. What Aristotle himself could not have made out or extracted had he come to life again for that special purpose. He was not at all easy about the wounds which Don Belianis gave and took, because it seemed to him that, great as were the surgeons who had cured him, he must have had his face and body covered all over with seams and scars. He commended, however, the author's way of ending his book with the promise of that interminable adventure, and many a time was he tempted to take up his pen and finish it properly, as is there proposed, which no doubt he would have done and made a successful piece of work too, had not greater and more absorbing thoughts prevented him. Many an argument did he have with the curate of his village, a learned man and a graduate of Seguenza, as to which had been the better knight, Palmerin of England, or Amadis of Gaul. Master Nicholas, the village barber, however, used to say that neither of them came up to the knight of Phoebus, and that if there was any that could compare with him, it was Don Jailer, the brother of Amadis of Gaul, because he had a spirit that was equal to every occasion, and was no finikin knight, nor lachrymose like his brother, while in the matter of valour, he was not a whit behind him. In short, he became so absorbed in his books that he spent his nights from sunset to sunrise, and his days from dawn to dusk, poring over them. And what, with little sleep and much reading, his brains got so dry that he lost his wits. His fancy grew full of what he used to read about in his books. Enchantments, quarrels, battles, challenges, wounds, wooings, loves, agonies, and all sorts of impossible nonsense. And it so possessed his mind that the whole fabric of invention and fancy he read of was true, that to him no history in the world had more reality in it. He used to say the Cid Ruy Diaz was a very good knight, but that he was not to be compared with the Knight of the Burning Sword, who with one backstroke cut in half two fierce and monstrous giants. He thought more of Bernardo de Calpio, because at Roncesvalles he slew Roland in spite of enchantments, availing himself to the artifice of Hercules when he strangled Antaeus, the son of Terra, in his arms. He approved highly of the giant Morgante, because although of the giant breed, which is always arrogant and ill-conditioned, he alone was affable and well-bred. But above all, he admired Reynaldos of Montalban, especially when he saw him sallying forth from his castle and robbing everyone he met. And when, beyond the seas, he stole that image of Mahomet, which, as his history says, was entirely of gold, to have a bout of kicking at that traitor of Ganelon, he would have given his housekeeper and his niece into the bargain. In short, his wits being quite gone, he hit upon the strangest notion that ever madman in this world hit upon, and that was that he fancied it was right and requisite, as well for the support of his own honour as for the service of his country, that he should make a knight-errant of himself, roaming the world over in full armour and on horseback, in quest of adventures, and putting in practice himself all that he had read as being the usual practices of knights errant. Writing every kind of wrong, and exposing himself to peril and danger from which, in the issue, he was to reap eternal renown and fame. Already the poor man saw himself crowned by the might of his arm, Emperor of Trebizond at least, and so, Led away by the intense enjoyment he found in these pleasant fancies, he set himself forthwith to put his scheme into execution. 
The first thing he did was to clean up some armour that had belonged to his great-grandfather and had been for ages lying forgotten in a corner, eaten with rust and covered with mildew. He scoured and polished it as best he could, but he perceived one great defect in it, that it had no closed helmet, nothing but a simple morion. This deficiency, however, his ingenuity supplied, for he contrived a kind of half-helmet of pasteboard which, fitted onto the morion, looked like a whole one. It is true that, in order to see if it was strong and fit to stand a cut, he drew his sword and gave it a couple of slashes, the first of which undid in an instant what had taken him a week to do. The ease with which he had knocked it to pieces disconcerted him somewhat, and to guard against that danger, he set to work again, fixing bars of iron to the inside until he was satisfied with its strength, and then, not caring to try any more experiments with it, he passed it and adopted it as a helmet of the most perfect construction. He next proceeded to inspect his hack, which, with more quartos than a real one, and more blemishes than the steed of Ganella, that tantum pelis et ossa fuit, surpassed in his eyes the Bocephalus of Alexander or the Babieca of the Seed. Four days were spent in thinking what name to give him, because, as he said to himself, it was not right that a horse belonging to a knight so famous, and one with such merits of his own, should be without some distinctive name. And he strove to adapt it so as to indicate what he had been before belonging to a knight errant, and what he then was, for it was only reasonable that, his master taking a new character, he should take a new name and that it should be distinguished and full-sounding one, befitting the new order and calling that he was about to follow. And so, after having composed, struck out, rejected, added to, unmade, and remade a multitude of names out of his memory of, and fancy, he decided upon calling him Rothinante, a name, to his thinking, lofty, sonorous, and significant of his condition as a hack, before he became what he now was, the first and foremost of all the hacks in the world. Having got a name for his horse so much to his taste, he was anxious to get one for himself, and he was eight days more pondering over this point, till at last he made up his mind to call himself Don Quixote, whence, as had already been said, the authors of this voracious history have inferred that his name must have been beyond a doubt Quisada and not Quesada, as others would have it. Recollecting, however, that the valiant Amadis was not content to call himself curtly Amadis and nothing more, but added the name of his kingdom and country to make it famous, and called himself Amadis of Gaul, he, like a good knight, resolved to add on the name of this, and to style himself Don Quixote of La Mancha, whereby, he considered, he described accurately his origin and country, and did honour to it in taking his surname from it. So then, his armour being furbished, his morion turned into a helmet, his hat christened, and he himself confirmed, he came to the conclusion that nothing more was needed now but to look for a lady to be in love with. For a knight errant without love was like a tree without leaves or fruit, or a body without a soul. As he said to himself, if, for my sins, or by my good fortune, I come across some giant hereabouts, a common occurrence with knights errant, and overthrow him in one onslaught, or cleave him asunder to the waist, or, in short, vanquish and subdue him. Will it not be well to have someone I may send him as a present? That he may come in and fall on his knees before my sweet lady, and in a humble, submissive voice say, I am the giant, Caraculiambro, lord of the island of Malindrania vanquished in single combat by the never sufficiently extolled knight, Don Quixote of La Mancha, who has commanded me to present myself before your grace, that your highness dispose of me at your pleasure. Oh, how our good gentleman enjoyed the delivery of this speech, especially when he had thought of someone to call his lady. There was, so the story goes, in a village near his own, a very good-looking farm girl, with whom he had been in love with at one time. Though, so far as is known, she never knew it, nor gave a thought to the matter, 
Her name was Aldonza Lorenzo, and upon her, he thought fit to confer the title of Lady of His Thoughts. And after some search for a name, which should not be out of harmony with her own, and should suggest and indicate that of a princess and great lady, he decided upon calling her Dulcinea del Toboso. She being of El Toboso, a name, to his mind, musical, uncommon, and significant. Like all those he had already bestowed upon himself, and the things belonging to him. Thank you. 